You've probably heard of the many terrifying and draining sleep disorders we as humans experience on Earth. From seeing demons in the dark under sleep paralysis, to heart-pounding night terrors, to the simply exhausting feeling of insomnia and not getting enough sleep, there are plenty of cases around the world in which a basic concept such as sleep becomes quite impossible. It's hard to rationalize all of the sleeping disorders we deal with on Earth, making the only thing harder to rationalize is the additional sleeping disorders astronauts deal with beyond Earth and out in the cosmos. Not only do space travelers have to deal with the effects of zero gravity and the varying laws of physics that differ from Earth, but they also must overcome the strenuous psychological toll interplanetary spaceflight has on the human body and mind. Imagine, after a long day filled with the pressures of operating a spaceship, communicating with mission control, and taking exhaustive measures to stay alive, you have to strap yourself into bed and close your eyes and ignore the fact you could wake up floating in the vacuum of the universe just to sleep. To get a better understanding of the sacrifices space travelers must make to get enough sleep in the final frontier, here's a deeper look at exactly what it's like to slumber in space. Astronomers researching and planning for sleeping in space dates back to the earliest projects that saw humans both explore the cosmos and walk the moon. Back in the early days of the Apollo mission by NASA, scientists were already expecting sleep disturbances in space and wanted to prepare their astronauts with the most accurate data to boost performance. After a full study was completed, NASA announced a nine-point plan to maximize an astronaut's sleep and avoid the pitfalls of sleep deprivation. They were, one, ensuring the pre-flight circadian rhythm wasn't disruptive for a period of time leading up to the launch date. A person's circadian rhythm is another word for a person's internal clock, in which waking and rising is in sync with daybreak and nightfall. Two, scheduling all of the crew members' sleep to occur at the same time. Three, allowing all crew members to sleep without their heavy spacesuits equipped. Four, blocking out six to eight hours per day on the official flight schedule to make sure no one was working and the sleeping quarters would be as quiet as possible. This meant little to no radio correspondence with mission control. Five, restraints would be provided so that crew members could strap themselves into bed securely without the fear of free-floating throughout the cabin. Six, whilst on the surface of the moon, crew members would be provided a hammock or similar sleeping surface to maximize comfort. Seven, the temperature of the sleeping cabin and the clothing provided for sleeping would be maximized in their comfort to promote better sleep. This meant a cooler temperature was used as the human body sleeps best in colder temps, as well as moisture wicking fabric to prevent night sweats. Eight, all crew members would be provided a sleeping mask to block out lights from within the cabin, even after the lights were already dimmed for optimal darkness. The sun would also be blocked out whenever visible during sleep schedules. Nine, louder objects and devices around the sleep cabin would either be muffled or shut off to eliminate harsh noises. As one can see, it didn't take long for everyone involved with spaceflight to realize the most important aspect of sleeping in space was finding the most optimal sleeping quarters possible, especially during travel. On the International Space Station, there are at all times at least three full-time crew members living and sleeping aboard the spacecraft. Only two of the crew members share a room, as there isn't enough space for three fastened sleeping bags. However, the third crew member is still provided one, and whichever area they choose for sleep will receive the same treatment as the main sleeping cabin. In modern times, NASA has established the Fitness for Duty Standards, 
which outlines strict directives for crew members to abide by. This includes an average of six and a half hours of work per day, maximizing at 48 hours per week, spread out across all seven days. Sometimes the workload is forced to increase and astronauts must endure periods of 10 hour workdays and 60 hour work weeks. This is when the sleep of astronauts is truly jeopardized as fatigue and other health issues kick in with a combination of exhaustion and interrupted sleep. Throughout the Apollo program, astronauts often returned to Earth and stated their best sleep came on the lunar surface due to the reintroduction of gravity grounding the crew members, as well as a somewhat regular night and day light schedule rebooting their circadian rhythms. Presently, NASA has reached a level of normalcy when it comes to designing the sleeping quarters for all of its space travelers. All sleeping cabins are a small quarters the size of a shower stall. Inside of the cabins are sleeping bags strapped to the walls with additional straps for astronauts to secure themselves to the bag. No matter the size of the sleeping cabin, it absolutely must have proper ventilation to allow for the inflow of oxygen and outflow of carbon dioxide. If the cabin is too stuffy or lacks ventilation, a sleeping astronaut could wake up suddenly, choking and gasping for air. This happens when a bubble of the astronaut's own carbon dioxide forms around their head while their bodies remain still during sleep. The side effects from the CO2 bubble phenomenon aren't just short-lived, however. After just five minutes of little to no oxygen, brain cells begin to die. The condition, called hypoxia, can be fatal and poses a serious risk for severe brain damage. Other long-term side effects include dementia or Alzheimer's disease, as well as an increased risk of stroke or developing seizures. It goes without saying, if astronauts want to survive both the intense elements of space travel and the battles of getting older, proper sleeping quarters are an absolute must. Humans have been studying sleep for as long as we've walked the Earth, at least in some capacity. Through these years of dedicated research, we've learned a lot regarding why our body needs sleep and what happens when we don't get enough of it. More recently, studies have shown that after just 17 consecutive hours of wakefulness, humans will start to suffer from similar cognitive impairments seen in individuals with a higher blood alcohol level. Depending on the situation, astronauts traveling through space might find themselves awake for equal, if not longer, durations of 17 hours due to either increased workload or just basic insomnia. This poses not only a risk to their own health, but the safety and livelihood of their fellow crew members. If severe fatigue, hallucinations, and or confusion take hold of an astronaut, their performance could involve technical misuse of the spaceship and or station, which could result in casualties. It could also lead to improper communication with mission control who are vital in bringing home crew members from space safe and sound. Astronauts are also more susceptible to the phenomenon known as microsleeps when experiencing wakefulness for too long. Microsleeps are the temporary yet instant periods of drowsiness and or sleep that last from one second to several seconds in which sensory inputs of the individual fail to elicit a response and the microsleeper goes unconscious. One doesn't need much of an imagination to think about what could happen if an astronaut fell unconscious while completing a task vital to the success of a mission. Another common sleep disorder seen amongst astronauts and space travelers is circadian rhythm sleep disorder. The disorder is exactly what the name implies, the disruption of our internal sleep-wake cycle causing sleeping issues. It goes without saying, those who depart from Earth and enter space see a fast appearing disruption to their circadian rhythm. There are varying periods of day versus night in space, depending on your position in relation to the sun. However, all periods of the 24 hour clock feature a night sky, as one might say on Earth, due to the lack of an atmosphere. 
While blue skies aren't necessarily required for maintaining a proper circadian rhythm, exposure to natural light is. Hunkered in a spaceship with few windows, facing away from the sun, or needing to sleep during day periods, are all ways astronauts fail to maintain their exposure to natural light and their circadian rhythm function. For example, crew members aboard the International Space Station can see upwards of 16 sunrises and sunsets each day. The repeated exposure to non-exposure of the sun can seriously disrupt a person's circadian rhythm, a phenomenon not often seen on Earth. A subcategory of circadian rhythm sleep disorder is shift work sleep disorder, or SWSD. SWSD is a condition in which someone who must awake during non-normal waking hours of the day, anywhere between 10 o'clock p.m. and 5 o'clock a.m., suffers from symptoms such as insomnia, daytime sleepiness, or both. This disorder affects those who work on shift schedules, like 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., or 4 a.m. to 12 p.m., who must wake up when it's customary for everyone else to be asleep. In simpler terms, it's for those who must wake up when it's dark outside, or fall asleep when the sun is up. Astronauts are included in this group, as they rarely get to align their entire work schedules around the customary period of nighttime we experience on Earth. When astronauts return home, they usually require a special routine to help them reset their circadian rhythm if it's not a permanent disorder. This includes chronotherapy, which is the incremental movement of bedtimes until it fits within the conventional 24-hour day and night. Others opt for light therapy, which is the introduction of a white, blue, or natural light measured between 5,000 to 10,000 lux to be shined directly on the subject for 30 to 60 minutes right before either falling asleep or after waking up. Sometimes, astronauts have even used hypnotics in conjunction with light therapy, in which a licensed hypnotist retrains the brain to adapt back to the natural circadian rhythm felt before space travel. Currently, much of the scientific research into sleeping in space is focused on finding solutions to bettering sleeping environments away from Earth. The thought behind this ideology is that someday, in the relatively near future, more and more humans will travel into space and inevitably sleep in space too. This will come with more issues of liability and long-term health, and thus, the commercial sectors of space traveling will want to minimize their risk. One study uses devices called ear EEGs. These minuscule instruments are placed in the sleeping astronaut's ear to measure the electrical activity of the crew member's brain. The results will give both sleep scientists and astronomers effective data showcasing the exact psychological and physiological characterization of sleeping and its effect on the brain. Other studies dive deeper into proper body posturing during sleep, since the absence of gravity makes it impossible for astronauts to lay their head down on a pillow like normal, or feel the weight of a blanket over their body. There's even been an influx in studies regarding the connections between genetics and why some astronauts struggle to sleep in space more than others, despite sharing the exact same schedule, activities, and diet. Early findings suggest there are polymorphisms, also called genetic variations, that are involved in physiological cycles of sleep-wake, circadian, and basic cognitive function. If these genes can be marked, researchers can predict exact changes in the vulnerability of our neurological health to analyze sleep disorders and obtain a sleep schedule homeostasis. This would then allow NASA and the other agencies to identify which future astronauts contain the polymorphism, who will also require special countermeasures for the inevitable insomnia and ensuing fatigue and confusion. Schedules could be optimized for each astronaut's performance, and with a rigid preparation while still on Earth, the sleeping disorders could be navigated entirely. Like all things associated with the cosmos, the topic of sleeping in space is a fascinating journey coupled together with so many other areas of science, such as psychology and genetics. 
One day, even more will be understood, and the opportunity for people like you or I to get a chance to sleep in space ourselves will be right at our fingertips.